Welcome as you're coming in, everyone. It's so good to be here with you today. And thank you for taking time out of your Sunday to be with us in this conversation centered around the question and the conversation, of course, of uh, looking back in order to move forward in a good way. And I want to just take a very brief moment to introduce um, our extraordinary guides and elders today, as well as to honor uh, a few of the lives that at least in our North American continent, um, we've lost this year in this field. And one of those people you may know, both of them, of course, um, the dear beloved Tanya Shiraz Odoms from Brooklyn, New York, and the beautiful Chris Miner, um, both whose lives touched so many people and truly were of service in the most um, deep and um, somewhat messy ways being on the ground in restorative justice practices. So, so welcome again, everybody, and thank you for being here. This is Looking Back, to move forward in a good way. And um, I'm Molly Rowan Leach of Restorative Justice on the Rise and my co-host and co-moderator of sorts of this conversation today is Jonathan Swartz of Eastern Minute Night University and the Zit Institute. So um, we're delighted and honored to be with all of you. Um, this is a conversation with the framework and lens um, of the shared power, the shared space that we um, show up for, hopefully as presently as possible in our own individual selves so that we may add to that beautiful wisdom that comes of the weave and weft and warp of um, that framework for being and living. So, um, I want to just also note before we close our conversation today that we'll have more information about Restorative Justice Week, um, the events that are coming up for, for Restorative Justice on the Rise offerings. But in, in addition to that, an invitation to those of you who might have other events you'd like to announce and invite people to um, because International Restorative Justice Week is certainly not just something that we're doing today and that RJ on the Rise is doing, but many across the globe are observing. So, um, so without further ado, we're going to defer to a heartfelt introduction of each of our elders um, with the idea in mind, again, that this is an invitation to rethink how we see those who have come before us, those um, as with the four that are with us for this panel, whose lives have been spent uh, very directly in this field um, or related areas or both that truly do inform the, the title and consideration of elder. But that again, we're all in this together and that we would like to step back from the idea of pedestalizing anyone. Um, so that we can come together in a good way. Um, as your co-host also, I intend no harm. Um, I know that I am a white privileged woman sitting in this position today. And I just want to acknowledge that if anything happens today that you'd like to discuss um, as your co-host, I welcome and honor always um, feedback and conversation. So, so as you know, we have in the room with us um, and we're setting a tone here for um, a deep dive, conversational style. John's, Jonathan is going to, in just a moment, open us up with a beginning prompt along the lines of this theme. Um, and I want you to know that we do have a, a Padlet that will have this recording, as well as a list of all of the amazing resources and materials associated with each of our guides and elders today. So um, in light of that, um, John, would you like to say a few words um, to introduce Howard? I think it would be wonderful if you would, please. 
Of course. Howard, is it okay if I say a few words to introduce you? So, um, Howard, uh, Howard has been a, a wonderful connection, a wonderful mentor um, as, yeah, as I have gotten my, gotten my start uh, in the, uh, in this field, in this work. Um, one of the things that I appreciate most about Howard is the vast, um, the network of, of people that Howard is connected to um, and connected to in a good way um, in ways that 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 really exemplify how Howard has sought to use um, use the power that he has that he has the influence that he has uh, and so I'm really appreciative um, that I get a chance to that I get a chance to know Howard uh, and that I get a chance to relate to Howard on a semi-weekly basis that's uh, been one of the one of the most wonderful parts of the last number of years for me. Thank you, Jonathan. One of the things I love about you, Howard, and each of you in this room is your accessibility. Um, I feel that you connect each of you in your own way uh, on a, a deeply authentic level um, when you're present with others. And um, that's really beautiful. And it's been an honor to work with UK um, to learn more about your work over decades and its origination um, and with Edward, which um, Edward, I'd like to honor you with your Lakota name and forgive me if I don't pronounce it fully correctly, but I'm going to try. Wanbli Wampaha Hokshila. Did I do okay? <laughs> So um, Edward, Edward is busy working on the next um, iteration of the Extraordinary Colorizing Restorative Justice. And I know it's been a very busy year for you. Um, I always love being in spaces with Edward because I know that we're going to deep, uh, take a deep dive and a real one. Um, and Fanya, it's an extraordinary honor to see your beautiful face again and be in the space with you today. Um, the last time I saw Fanya was in Oakland, and um, that's been way too long, and that was the most extraordinary conference. Thank you again for all the heart and soul that went into that. I know there were many people surrounding you and with you on that. So, like I said before, um, we will make a list of links for you of all the extraordinary works of these beautiful people in the room. Uh, but let's get started so we have plenty of time to dive into the discussion and then also to have um, questions and conversations with you. Thank you, everyone. Yes, for those of you who are attending and viewing the webinar, feel free to use the Q&A um, portion at the, the bottom of your screen to ask any questions. We may or may not have time to get to those. Um, but um, but please use that as a space to um, to engage. So, but we want to hear from you all. Uh, that's why we're that's why we're here today. Um, so, just as a as a place to get started, um, the title of this session has to do with looking back and looking forward. Uh, and the framing, as you know, uh, is that you are some of the folks who have a longer view in looking back. You are and have been mentors and elders to many. Who are the mentors and or elders that you're listening to or that you have listened to? Who has shaped your journey? And what are the gifts that they have left for you? We don't have any particular order. Uh, we want this to be conversational. So feel free to respond as, um, as you feel, yeah, as you feel led. Knowing this group, you're probably going to have to call on people. Now. I think that was you volunteering to go first, Howard. Straight <laughs> if I said anything, but I do think <laughs> it's true. Well, there's so many people, so many people. When I think about it, I, I, you know, it would go on forever. The, the names that always come to my mind when someone asks me this. So, and some of you heard me talk about this. Vincent Harding. And Dr. Harding was such a, I mean, he, my, I think he really launched me on my journey toward justice. Uh, 
Vincent was a colleague of Dr. King. He was a speechwriter for him, uh, an advisor, and so forth. And uh, several times when I was a high school student, he stayed in our home. And I have a very, very clear memory of sitting at the dining room table where Vincent tried to help this white, naive high school student understand something about race and justice in this country. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons I ended up at Morehouse. And then when I think of Morehouse, I think of Dr. Melvin Kennedy, who was my advisor there and had such an, who was really helped my guide during those times, but he also kind of, while we hadn't imagined anything like restorative justice, he helped me sort out my career path that made, made such a difference. So those come to mind. Um, just a couple others I'll mention. As a, Nils Christie, the Norwegian criminologist who died a few years ago, his thought was right, it was influential to me, especially his little book, Limits to Pain, which uh, really asked basic questions about why we punish and you know and about the whole punishment thing. And his book, which I thought of as a provocative essay, was a, a model for my own book, Changing Lenses. Um, I could other talk about others, but one other person I want to mention who's really younger than I am, and she'd want me to make sure that I said that, is Lorraine Stutzman Amstutz. Uh, Lorraine entered the field soon after I did and worked with me in Elkhart and was such a fantastic practitioner. And we worked together for decades. Uh, and I learned so much about the actual practice of restorative justice with, with, through Lorraine. So I, I want to mention her there. But I'll let other people pick up here. Uh, Like I say, you've got to call people. You can you can also maybe toss it to someone, Howard. Okay, I thought I was thinking of tossing it to you, so let's do that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, it's uh, so good to be here uh, and uh, to be with. Um, people that I deeply honor and respect uh, in this work that we do. I'm coming from Oakland, the, the land of the, un, the unceded land of the uh, Chochenyo Ohlone people. Um, you know, I think the panel was first called Listening to the Elders. And, <laughs> and I was going to, I don't know what prompted the change, but I was gonna push back on, on that a little bit and say, uh, you know, if it's a unidirectional thing, uh, then I'll definitely push back uh, because I've learned so much from young people uh, and I'll perhaps name some of them. And um, I really believe that when when uh, massive changes are needed in our culture and our society, that history calls upon young people uh, to enact those changes, to lead those changes. And um, that was certainly from my, true from my generation in the 60s and uh, all the way up until today with Black Lives Matter and Standing Rock and um, the climate uh, catastrophe movement. Um, so I won't give that whole speech. <laughs> um, so I would say, first of all, that my mother uh, was, was uh, very formative, um, had a very formative influence on on who I've become um, growing up under racial apartheid. And I, I mean that literally. Um, and it's not well known that, in, that the South Africans actually studied uh, racial segregation in this country to develop their system of racial apartheid. Uh, they looked specifically at the laws and practices in the city where and state where I come from, um, Birmingham or Birmingham, Alabama. <clears throat> so uh, my mother, uh, in these in in these um, racial apartheid like conditions, uh, where the pervasive social messaging was always you're inferior, you're subhuman, you don't deserve beautiful homes and to go to swimming pools or to go to amusement parks and. Um, <clears throat> She was constantly standing up uh, and resisting this. And um, 
let me just share a story. We were downtown, my mother and I, one day in, in Birmingham, Alabama, and she was at the counter concluding a purchase. And she'd given the young white man um, <clears throat> at the, at the um, cash register cash, and he was giving her change back. And he said, Sally, here you go. Here's your change, young white man. And my mother is what, you know, in her 50s or so. And my mother responded, well, first of all, she just kind of stared at him. She paused and she looked at him and said, young man, my name is Mrs. Sally Davis. And if you refuse to, if you can't call me by that name, I'm happy to take my business elsewhere. You know, very calm with, with great equanimity um, and also very, very strong and very firm. Uh, and unmoving, uh, and that happened every day, constantly. You know, as a child. Uh, so, and my father as well. My father was a quieter person, but when we were growing up, he and the other fathers in the neighborhood uh, formed an armed patrol to protect their families from the bombings of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, so, if there were noises at night, he would run down, grab his gun and run downstairs and, and look for, you know, uh, perhaps bombs or perhaps terrorists uh, in the bushes outside of our home. Uh, so those two persons. And then I have a, a an indigenous elder by the name of Credo Mutwa, who taught me so much um, um, about uh, healing um, wisdom in African traditions. Um, and then they're young people. I'll just name them without, you know, describing them. Uh, well, maybe I'll talk a little bit about Trisha Hersey. She's a young person that I'm listening to now. And she talks about the importance of rest, how resting the body is, 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 is a form of resistance. We live in this grind culture where, you know, we are measured by how much we accomplish every day, how much we tick off on our to-do list. Uh, and she says, in fact, this kind of pushing the body, you know, to the limits uh, is a holdover from, is a legacy of a continuation of slavery where the body is a machine and, and it's, it's that only value is in its uh, productivity, um, and it's a it's a legacy of racial capitalism, um, and um, and it's an, affir an affirmation of the idea that we are not we are not uh, you know machines. Uh, we are divine beings, and so Trisha Hersey and then Bayo Akofomode. Akofomode uh, also talks about uh, the slow work movement, or he's a leader in the slow work movement in this country. Um, and then Adrian Marie Brown, who is an incredibly fecund thinker who brings together chaos theory, systems theory, Marxism, Leninism, abolitionism, um, and complexity theory, biomimicry, and so many vast, uh, such a, such a, a vast diversity of uh, different thoughts, and she was she was mentored by Grace Lee Boggs, who is who I'll just end with Grace Lee Boggs, who uh, really uh, has has inspired and influenced me because um, she talks about the need to infuse our activism with spirituality um, and the need not just to to tear down, to have an activism that doesn't simply tear down what we are against, but that creates new worlds um, and that creates what we want. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll stop there. And I will toss it to Edward. I think you're muted. Wow, thank you, Fania. I was just down in the uh... Birmingham with uh, Jazz, Jasmine's story in uh, October. She gave me the tour and my goodness, uh, I'm so inspired. <laughs> you stopped uh, by my house on the top of Dynamite Hill? I didn't get quite get there, but mm -hmm. but I'll, I'll go back again and, okay. uh, Great. and really get the tour. But um, 
So first of all, I want to say that I am speaking from my homelands. Uh, it's settler occupied. And for those uh, uh, who want to know what my homeland is, it's Minnesota, Nebraska, parts of Colorado, Wyoming, South Dakota, North Dakota, parts of uh, Montana, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. Those are the settler names of my homelands. That's why we call it occupied. We ourselves call it the Ocheti Shakomi uh, Oyate Makoche, the land that belongs to the people of the seven council fires. And only because it's American, a Native American Heritage Month, I thought I'd do some education here. Um, I also want to uh, thank Molly and the other panelists, you know, for being here. I consider it an honor and a privilege to uh, <clears throat> be thrown in with the elders. Um, you know, I, I, I um, appreciate that. And I also just want to take time to uh, thank the participants as well. I know it's, uh, you know, Sunday, it's a weekend, but I appreciate you being here. Um, wow, the list of who I would consider mentors and things like that. First of all, I, I would just have to, on my short list, Vine Deloria Jr., who wrote Custer Died for Your Sins, uh, Elizabeth Cooklin, who had wrote Anti-Indianism, uh, and a personal community favorite is uh, Frank LaPointe. He, he will very rarely make the print, but again, he's someone who was influential in my life. And then the, the Seneca scholar, John Mohawk, um, another good one. And I cannot forget my people, my ancestors as well, who influenced uh, I think my thinking, and finally, I think the one person that has had a, uh, uh, well, a couple of people. One is Jasmine's story. You know, she uh, she's a firecracker. Oh my goodness! Spending one day with her, you're exhausted. <laughs> um, but um, so I, I really uh, am, am inspired by her of that next generation coming up, and then my daughter. Oyate Kigalawi, who at the age of six years old was in the front lines against the RCMPs. So um, on defending her unceded territory up in British Columbia. So I have a very auspicious list here and many of them you may, most of the people, most of the settlers will never hear the name of these people, but I do want to acknowledge them, give a shout out to them. So, yeah. So, okay, you're next. Thank you. Thank you to everyone for, for being here. Um, and I'm speaking from Minnesota ancestral territory of Dakota and um, was named by Edward in its relationship to the seven council fires. Also um, home to Anishinaabe people. Um, so Fania, interesting that you referred to the the title that that was put out originally. <laughs> Listening to the elders, I was uh, uncomfortable with that, and so I contacted Molly to say because because it sounds like a one-way thing <laughs> uh, with everybody, our peers, you know, our age peers, as well as those who are, are younger. And I was like, mm, that's not okay, <laughs> because that suggests that we in some way are above and we're not. You know, that, that is this business of trying to move away from our deep habits of setting some people above others. Um, for me, it was really important that we be careful <laughs> about that. There are so many people, there's so many little pieces in the mosaic of, of the things that, that I believe, um, the ways in which I have been 
uh, informed in, uh, in the journey. Um, so it's, it's, you know, and it's really hard to, to sort it out. And, and my own journey is so different, for instance, than Howard's, where as a young person, he got this inspiration about justice. And as a young person, I did not know that it was possible to make a difference in the world. I mean, I grew up with a very strong sense of ethics, that they had a responsibility to live in a good way, but not that one could actually um, give oneself's one's life to, to, act, to making a difference. That was not a part of the landscape I grew up in. There were not conversations about justice at that level in my, there was a very strong sense of fairness at a very personal level, but, um, so that, that came to me uh, later, but Howard himself <laughs> as a, a key inspiration for me, uh, Kay Harris, slightly before Howard with a feminist vision of justice, really shaped how I looked at Howard's writing and my understanding of, of what those principles were was through the lens of, of Kay Harris. And then there are people like, like Annie Sullivan that Fanya knows, um, John McLagan, who was the, my boss at the Department of Corrections, who modeled how to be a good bureaucrat, uh, who cleared space around me for me to do what felt right for me and, and sort of protected me from the usual sort of risks in a, a bureaucracy. Carol Erickson, who was on the, um, who was a school superintendent when I served on a school board, who who modeled for me how to be in front of a group of people who are angry at you and be non-defensive, you know, just, to, uh, just to embody love, even when, when people are coming at you pretty strong. Um, there are just so, so many people um, along the way. Um, Ginny Mackey, really, really important. Um, she had done, uh, she was a white woman, but had been, very active in uh, racial strife in Rochester, New York, and she really taught me early lessons about how it is as a white person that, that you try to be in spaces and, um, and make space for, uh, for other people. And, and Barbara Ray, who taught me way before we have the language now for it, the idea that the idea of and this was in the early 90s, of the white centric nature of organizations, that, that they, the organizations themselves had, um, had a culture that was already not, even though they were intending to be welcoming to, to other people. Um, just so many. And I, I do want to mention uh, John McKnight, had a really big impact on me in terms of giving me language for, I came into the field with no professional training related in any way and came because of my school board experience came with a very strong sense that ordinary lay people have a lot of wisdom <laughs> and that we need to tap into that more. And, and John McKnight gave me language for, for how to talk about that um, the idea of deprofessionalizing human care and um, being community, deprofessionalizing being community. So um, those are a few of, oh, and, and um, Tanaga Yago, who's a Native American woman who has been walking this journey with me for about 20 years, who's also uh, a cherished family friend and um, very, very influential in helping me to internalize, at least to some degree, uh, a worldview very different than the one that, that I grew up with. So um, I will leave it back to you, John. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you all so much. Fania, are you, I think you're muted right now. 
before Kay mentioned Howard, I realized I had not mentioned Howard or Gay. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, acknowledge those two persons, those two individuals as being uh, really uh, formative uh, in my development as a restorative justice uh, practitioner and thinker. Um, they were the first persons that I contacted uh, when we formed Restorative Justice for Oakland Youth uh, to come. Howard came first and spent some days with us. And, um, and then Kay came and did a few trainings with us. Uh, and their writings, of course, were very influential um, and very moving um, and resonant for me. Um, and that sort of, that lit uh, a spark, lit the, this fire within me. Um, so I just, I couldn't not say that. So thank you for allowing me to. I still remember meeting you in Minnesota at that conference the first time. I was just so impressed and excited with what you were doing. So yeah, I said, who is this white man that went to Morehouse College? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. I know I'm in the right place. That's, that's when I first met you too, Fanya, right? The the one at Hamlin? Hamlin, yeah. Yeah. A different, oh, I, I think that's just, You know, and I'm like, wow, this human being, so elegant, so smart. This is such an amazing uh, person. Yeah, it was just so delightful to meet you there. Thank you. Thanks. I think I remember some one phrase I remember there is some, we were talking about the problems changing facing the field that a lot of people don't want to listen to don't want to hear and somebody talked about a skunk at a bar at a garden party so I, somebody I talked about what being a skunk at a bar at a garden party <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah Kay, i remember meeting you and um denise at the hamlin conference I think I almost remember what you were wearing, actually. <laughs> oh, and I remember your name tag. <laughs> remember, we had we had art materials to make name tags, and we had been uh, in the planning. We were like, "Oh, should we do this at a law school? Is this really going to work at a law school conference?" <laughs> and then we decided, "Yes, we're going to do this." Right. Fine. Oh yeah. Made the most beautiful name tag I've ever seen. <laughs> Thank you. But speaking of law schools and, and art and name tags, uh, I think this was Northwestern Law in Chicago. Uh, it was just so striking to reflect on the fact that in this law school lecture room, uh, we began the day uh, with dance, with Native American dance and drumming and uh, and, and since then, I've done yoga and and and, and stretching and and and, and uh, law schools. So it's yeah, the transformative impact of restorative justice. Yeah. Y'all, you all are you're you're like getting into the prompts without even being prompted, right? Um, the next one is, we're talking about. You're already doing this, but reflecting on the last. Um, number of years, but um, what are what are memorable moments um, for you specifically related to um, to this field of restorative justice? And um, and would love to hear uh, the stories. That's um, part of what what makes this such a wonderful time is the stories that um, that connect us. Edward, I'd love to hear I'd love to hear a story from you. Well, thank you. Um, well, I, I think just in the most recent time, I, I think just doing the work uh, with Living Justice Press on publishing the book, Colorizing Restorative Justice, um, that, that was a project that um, uh, the, the executive director, Denise Baton, had a concern about Living Justice Press publishing mostly literature from uh, whites on RJ. And so we had a discussion and then we put out, we put out a call for colorizing restorative justice. And we had a, a, a really good response. 
Yeah. And then and then working with those contributors to, to that volume has been um, transformative in ways that we had developed a community. And to this day, we still support each other, talk to each other, but also um, we can see the impact of, of this, of color rising restorative justice in a way that it has engendered discussions that are going on. I've been invited to a lot of discussions over the past year and a half since the book came out. And these, it has generated some really deep, and I would say downright difficult discussions, but people are hanging in there. And it's so it's opened up a space. Um, and we get emails all the time from uh, people of color who have, and, and also white people who have read the book and um, have said it, it has allowed them to be uh, more daring, uh, more brave, and talking about the issues uh, that intersect restorative justice, like race, gender, settler colonialism, that, that kind of thing. And then I think probably in my young age, when I was just in high school, when Wounded Knee Two happened in 1973, um, that was a watershed moment for my generation. Uh, we were undergoing a lot of colonization. And when um, the American Indian movement began to say, no, we are a sovereign people. We are, we are, we are occupied by the settlers. And then, I, you know, I went to school with a lot of uh, whites who, um, you know, from grade school to high school, and then to hear how anti-native anti they were after knowing them all those years, it just stunned me that, that um, I mean, I found it just, just, just amazing how you could be with these, uh, you know, white classmates in elementary school, junior junior high school, and, and senior high school, high school. And until Wounded Knee Two happened, then you really got to see the anti-nativism and the internalized um, racism that they had, and it and it just shocked me into you know, um, sh shocked me into my senses because they felt comfortable enough with us to express their true feelings. And then we pushed back and we said, this is not the way it's going to be. So, so I, I would have to say Wounded Knee 2 has been a, a major generational change for Native people in general, but I, I think it, it just really set my, the course for the rest of my life, knowing that, you know, can we trust settlers? And I, and I would even argue to this day as a Lakota, I can't speak for other indigenous people, but I think the issue of trust is a huge issue among my nation. And, it, and so this, these indigenous land acknowledgements that are going on, I often put that the litmus test for indigenous land acknowledgement is the return of our stolen lands. And that's the accountability piece. And I wish all settlers would. This is Native American Heritage Month, for crying out loud. You know, I wish, I wish, I wish the settlers would sit and think about how they how they're going to return our stolen land. And, and so I'll leave I'll leave the discussion with that question. I want to share uh, a story of there, there are a number of places in my journey where it's a very, very thin thread <laughs> that links to uh, where I am today, or at least that's how it, it seems to me that it could so easily not have happened. And um, one of those has to do with um, getting to know Barry Stewart, which ultimately shaped the focus of my work in, in restorative justice. So there was the, um, 
It was an organization that sponsored a, con a conference every two years on peacemaking that met in Minneapolis. And I did a workshop with, uh, along with a couple of other people. This was in 95. In 95, did a workshop on um, restorative justice as a peacemaking process. And uh, that was an, at a time when almost nobody knew the term at all. And in that uh, workshop that I did, and we were in the Hilton in Minneapolis, and, um, and, and you had to be a navigator to find the room that we were in. You had to go down, and you had to go underneath something, and then, and then there was this little tiny room that, that we were in, a small group of people, and it was morally weekend. And, and there's this big guy in the audience who, when we start you know, having interaction between the speakers and the audience, who's talking about these circles that they're doing in Canada, sentencing circles. And it's, it immediately sparks for me because my interest is community more than crime. And the, this process is clearly more about community than about crime itself. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, <laughs> and other people seem to know who he is and I'm embarrassed. I don't know who he is. And so I'm too embarrassed to ask who this is. So I went, I thought, oh, I, I know how to, to, <laughs> to fake my way through this and went up and asked him for a card, but he was in shorts. It was Memorial Day weekend and he's pretty casual and he didn't have any cards on him. So I let him walk out of the room. I didn't know who he was. May of, uh, May of 95. I had been asked to speak uh, at a conference in Winnipeg, the Canadian Criminal Justice Association conference in Winnipeg, and I think it was October of 95, so it was that, that fall, and I believe that's where I met Howard as well. <laughs> that, um, and now I worked for the Department of Corrections, and they would not pay for any travel, so I had to do this on my own one way or another, and I decided I would drive. It's an eight-hour drive, but I I could do long distance driving. I would drive rather than fly. And they would find somebody to give me a bed while I was there. Um, and then as it gets close to the conference and, and I had promised to do this session to somebody I had gotten to know in um, an earlier, before I went to the Department of Corrections, I'd gotten to know this guy, uh, Graham is his last name, but, um, and, and I had told him I would come and do this. People were interested. This position I had in Minnesota was unique and probably in the world. And so people were interested. What is this? What's, what's going on? They wanted me to talk about that. Um, as it gets closer to the conference, it turns out I have to pay for registration. <laughs> Heard I'm coming to do a workshop for them on my own dime and I've got to pay for registration. And so my resistance is building and building. But because I have a relationship with the guy who asked me to come and I told him I would come, I keep overcoming the, the, the resistance because this is gonna come out of my own pocket. The department's not gonna pay for this. Um, and then the day I was supposed to leave or the day before I was supposed to leave, the muffler went out on our, uh, our van. That was the car I was gonna drive. One of the other vehicles we had, cause we had several teenagers at the time. <laughs> One of the other vehicles that we had, my daughter had had a small accident with and the passenger side door was smashed in. Um, and, and I tried to get in to get this muffler replaced because it's not good for you to drive a vehicle besides the noise problem. That it's actually not good for the engine <laughs> to drive it a long distance without proper muffler. And, uh, and, and all the time I'm thinking, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? <laughs> this is out of my own pocket, time away from my own family on a weekend. <laughs> and now I, I don't have a vehicle. I ended up driving the one with the smashed in door on the other side because it was, it was still functional. And because of all of this fooling around with the cars and I had to switch cars on the street with my daughter who was parked off by, over by the university and, on all the, and this is all before cell phones, mind you all before cell phones. Uh, and I have instructions for how to get to the place that, that I'm going to stay, but it's late before I leave. I had planned to leave in time to arrive during daylight 
by the time I'm finished with all of this, it's dark. And um, I get up there at midnight or one o'clock and Winnipeg has this habit of changing street names when you're still in a straight line. So I'm trying to follow these directions. No GPS. We're just talking about directions that you're given and then you write down. <laughs> Following, trying to find the place and the street name changes when you haven't turned. <laughs> I did it and they left the key in the mailbox. I eventually made it there. And lo and behold, who else was at this, this conference? Barry Stewart, whose name I didn't know. So if I'd seen anything about it ahead of time, I wouldn't have known that, that that's who it was. But I see the guy, I recognize him and get to spend time to learn more about exactly what it was he was doing. And, and from there is really the, yeah, the story uh, of my work. And, and this was 95, I don't, I'd been, I first read Howard's pamphlets in 89 and I'd been active in restorative justice since 89, 90, but I had not met Howard until that conference, I think. But it was, I came so close to canceling. I came so close to canceling. And I'm not sure that I would have connected with Barry um, without that particular event. So that's my story. <laughs> I'll pass it to you, Howard. So when I was thinking, you know, this is really a continuation of the previous question, because when I, I think of all these so-called students that I've had the privilege of learning from, my, my colleague, John Paul Lederach, used to call them colleagues masquerading as students, because that's really what they were. We, we, our program was for practitioners, and so they were practitioners, and we were learning from each other. Yeah, I learned so much and, and two things, two areas. One of them was how to use arts in teaching, drama and other kinds of things. And the other is I had so many students from indigenous traditions around the world and to begin to realize how restorative justice resonated and didn't resonate with their traditions. And there's one story that I've often told, but it was so impactful in my uh, re basic restorative justice class somewhere in the semester, I would require people to go find somebody that didn't know anything about restorative justice and explain it and see what happened. And, oh, some of them were just funny. People would go to a bar and tap somebody on the shoulder and say, or they go home for Thanksgiving, have a big fight at the dining table, or the guy from Nigeria calls home and tries to explain it to his mother who wasn't buying it. You know, and, uh, but there was this fellow from uh, Rwanda whose family who had been who had lost his family in the genocide there, and he had come to study and just to get away and find some peace and he had he had just married a Rwandan woman and so he decided he would explain it to his wife uh, and so he sits down and he's telling me this he, he sits down he starts explaining restorative justice and she just breaks out laughing and he said well why are you laughing she said you come all the way over here and you paid all this money to what learn what to learn what every African already knows yep that's there you are <laughs> but I, I've learned so much from that. The other thing that came to mind as Kay was talking was just my interaction with New Zealand and how much I learned from that. In 1994, was was only a few years after the Young, young Persons and Their Families Act had, had begun to transform the youth justice system in New Zealand, although they, they didn't, initially didn't know about restorative justice. I was asked to come and speak at a conference and then to pay my way. Uh, they I didn't know they were doing that's how they were paying my way, but they itinerated me all over the two islands to speak. I was on the radio and so forth. And I began to see what they were doing and what a revolutionary thing they were doing and how it responded to Maori concerns about justice, about tradition and about institutional racism. Uh, it had been so clear that they had made a case to the, to the government, country and the government that this what they were doing with the Western legal system was institutionally racist and culturally inappropriate. Uh, anyway, I've had the privilege to go back many times and interact and that, that really had changed my thinking about how things could be done and how things, how that connection could be made with, with uh, indigenous traditions. The other just thing to mention this year that I was so pleased about, I, my training is a historian, I'm a PhD in history. And 
who knew that there was the Smithsonian Institute of American History have a Center for Restorative History? Funny and I've both been able to interact with that. Uh, it's wonderful. Whoever would have dreamed up that restorative justice would have something to do with re repairing, restoring history. But anyway, that's, that's an ongoing relationship and I'm very, very pleased with it. So that's, I mean, there are many others, but you know, Fania, it's yours too, all right. You're muted yet. I have a puppy, a, like a four and a half month old puppy and I can hear him and you may hear some noise in the background. If worse comes to worse, I'll have to go and get him and just to calm him down. Um, uh, so yeah, restorative history, that's, I'd never heard of restorative history. It's, it's such a wonderful revelation. Uh, and thank you for inviting, having me and in, get invited uh, to that discussion. Um, and there's restorative economics, restorative finance, restorative architecture, or restorative, just, it's, it's just amazing. Um, so I guess I'll start with, um, with, uh, you know, how I learned about restorative justice. Um, I come from a background uh, of lifelong activism, having been born and coming of age in, in Bombingham, Alabama, living atop Dynamite Hill. That was the name of our neighborhood. <clears throat> uh, bombings going around, going off around us frequently uh, because we were living in a neighborhood where blacks were pushing the color line, black families were moving into previously all white areas. So the Klan responded with terror. And then, you know, our church was firebombed and the, just two blocks away, and the uh, home of an attorney who worked with Thurgood Marshall, who was then an NAACP attorney, to bring down the walls of segregation. His home was bombed four times, uh, lots of bombings. Um, and then of course, the 15th of September, 1963 bombing, where I lost two very close friends in that Sunday school bombing. And so uh, this was kind of the crucible that, uh, formed me, you know, as a, as a warrior for justice, uh, uh, that's, I was consumed with, with that, uh, and, and uh, left Alabama only wanting to be a, a, an effective warrior for, for justice. Um, couldn't imagine doing anything else in my life. <clears throat> and left Alabama and joined almost all the major movements of my time and for, and then became a, a trial lawyer fighting racism in the courts. Um, you've heard this story before. Um, um, after 25 or so years of, 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 of uh, cultivating hyper-masculinist, hyper-rational and, and bellicose uh, ways of being, which I thought I needed to cultivate in order to be a good trial lawyer and to be a strong uh, social justice activist. I became ill um, and, uh, and through dreams and, um, and synchronistic events, I came to sense that I was being invited by the ancestors, by spirit, by the creator to bring more healing energies uh, to come into balance in my life and to bring more spiritual energies. Uh, essentially, I was burning out, so I, so I needed to sort of meet that fire with some healing waters, and, and I was kind of led to, uh, there he goes, I don't know if you heard it, but uh, I was led to a PhD program, which allowed me to study in Africa. I, I was initiated by uh, the, the, a few um, uh, healers, especially Kredo Mutwa, who I mentioned earlier, and I finished that, came home, finished the PhD, and uh, went to a conference of lawyers where I learned about restorative justice. Uh, and, <clears throat> you know, when I went in, to Africa and, and came to study with many different indigenous healers from around the world, I didn't think that, in my mind, had anything to do with my uh, career, my profession as a lawyer, as a champion of justice. Um, it was just something that I felt uh, drawn to. I felt that I had to do. Um, 
um, without thinking about how that might affect my career until I was invited to this conference where I learned about restorative justice uh, from Ronnie Earle, who was a prosecutor in Texas. Um, and that's kind of really um, was, a, was a pivotal moment for me. Uh, this justice that heals, this justice that seeks uh, to, I think as Kay has said, uh, to uh, get people well rather than get even with them. Um, I immediately saw the connection between my justice uh, um, life path, my justice seeking, uh, and indigenous uh, ways. Um, so it was a real pivotal and, and, and an important moment for me. And um, so after that, I contacted Kay, I contacted uh, uh, Howard, I read every book I could on restorative justice. I went to, to conferences or to trainings with Kay, and, and I went uh, to trainings with Howard or events where Howard was, and, and tried to learn everything that I could. And was very excited um, um, and as, 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 as hopeful as I was, as, as moved as I was, um, it was really life altering for me learning about this. I could be a warrior and a healer at the same time. Normally we think of those things as opposites, but I could bridge those opposites through restorative justice. And then I started reading the literature and there was just, uh, oodles and oodles of books and, and, and articles and um, all kinds of resources on restorative justice. I was shocked to find that there were no, little or no articles or publications on the issue of race and restorative justice. I, I, I couldn't believe it, really. I had, that had been my, all my life, you know, addressing issues of race and racial justice. Um, and one would think that a movement that seeks to transform uh, our current ju justice system uh, would have some consciousness about the people who were most harmed by that very same justice system, but it was not there. Um, and, you know, I was shocked in some ways, in other ways I was not because of white supremacy, because of structural racism, because of peace movement, the women's movement, the environmental movement, and so many other movements. Uh, uh, were uh, affected by systemic racism as well. Uh, so in some ways I wasn't uh, surprised, uh, but I was very distressed and, and immediately started to think with others about how we could uh, remediate this. And uh, so I, I remember my first conference that I went to in North Carolina, there were just a handful of people of color there and only two people who were giving presentations on any subject having to do with race, and that was me and Dr. Dr. J. Morris Jenkins. Um, so he and I and others uh, started to, you know, think about well, what what can we do. So for the next few um, national conferences after that, uh, you saw you could see the transformation. You could see the increasing numbers of black people, people of color there. You could see, uh, especially about Oakland, you could see like hundreds of, of people of color. You would, you saw just scores of formerly incarcerated people and LGBTIA people and scores of young people. And I didn't go to the conference in, in, in Chicago, but I imagine that um, the same uh, pattern, you saw the same patterns there. So, um, you know, there's a lot more work that we need to do in, in, in our movement, um, but uh, that's, that's the story uh, that I, I want uh, to share. And, you know, we never, I just want to add that reality is constantly changing. And so uh, we need as organizations and individuals to change along with it. Uh, I'm really happy to see col colorizing restorative justice. Uh, restorative justice in urban schools, listening to the movement. Um, um, these are the titles that have come out just in recent years, and I'm sure many more to come. Are you doing a second for a second edition of Colorizing, uh, Edward? Did I hear that? 
Well, we're doing a, we're doing a colorizing circle practices, naming the oh. silences. Okay. Okay. Great. Good. Good. So I'm just, I'm happy to see this trend now that moving in, in, a, in a positive direction. Mm -hmm. So do we want to take an opportunity to um, just check in and see if there's any reflection before we move on to our next suggested prompt? Something bring additional aliveness for you and what, what we've shared so far. That makes sense. <laughs> Howard, uh, uh, please unmute. <laughs> we want to hear you. You can see me waving my hands. <laughs> <laughs> well, the next prompt, I think, is going to have something to do with the promises, what's most promising, and exactly what uh, what Fani is talking about is what I think of, is all of these diverse young voices with new energy and new directions. And I mean, that's what's really, that's what's so exciting about this. Uh, it, it's, uh, you see these elders move off the stage and let others others take over. Mm -hmm. And Jasmine, the person that you mentioned in the beginning, uh, um, Edward is, is one of those young people that with fresh ideas and uh, that are coming into the leadership uh, of the restorative justice movement. Yeah. And I think um, we as a movement, I would like to see us um, ally more with uh, uh, anti-racist movements. Uh, you know, we've started that process. Um, I think, you know, Black Lives Matter movements, um, um, indigenous movements, and seeing us all as being in this together. That's something that's relatively new uh, also. Mm -hmm. I think we've seen that in the last few conferences. You know. I would I would have to agree with Fania. I mean, my goodness, some of the most penetrating conversations have been with the other Black brothers and sisters, and sitting down and comparing notes and where the intersections lie, and building a narrative around how we can move forward and make uh, restorative justice. Um, the movement itself more accountable, more aligned with its rhetoric and more aligned with its ethics with respect to indigenous peoples and peoples of color. And the, uh, the BIPOC circles, if we want to use that term, have been just energizing um, beyond my wildest imaginations. And I know Fania will agree with me. Um, when we get in those kind of circles, the humor starts flying left and right. And I always find that to be such a energizing part of that, that it, in the depths of our deep discussions, this humor just comes out too. And so we can really laugh at um, ourselves in ways that is healthy and, um, so, so I, and I also agree with Fania in terms of some of the younger uh, people who are in the restorative justice, transformative justice, community justice, justice, reparative justice. Um, it, in terms of the, in terms of the hope that they have, um, I, I find a lot of commonalities that she had mentioned in terms of the global co community or the global majority as we're starting to call it now. And so I get pretty excited when we talk about the transformation that is happening. And of course, it's not easy. I mean, we, we see that in the US today, there's such pushback by you know, the settlers in terms of these transformations that are beginning to manifest themselves more concretely. And, but, uh, 
I am of the great hope that, um, you know, we push back and we say, this is the new reality. And we have to work toward what that means. So that's one of my reflections. Yeah, yeah and if, if I can just briefly say uh, something else, you know, our nation um, was born in oceans of blood and um, traumas of slavery, the slave trade, genocide, land theft, federal patriarchy, human supremacy, white supremacy. And that is the seed, that, that's our origin story as a nation. That is the seed of who we have become. And we are a nation that, that generates untold harm, you know? That's who we are. And we as restorative justice practitioners commit ourselves to addressing harm and centering the voices of those who have been harmed um, and, 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 and learning to become healers. And you know, in many ways, that's a very subversive thing to do in our culture. Um, and so we as restorative justice practitioners, it's, it's so important for us to stand up and, and address and, and, and uh, remediate these historical harms that continue. I, I think we have, I think there's, there's a great opportunity in all of these hundreds of truth and reconciliation processes that are arising in the nation post George Floyd. Uh, the all of the uh, reparations initiatives in hundreds of localities and in states and uh, at least the one um, or two uh, uh, legislative initiatives uh, in Congress on truth and reconciliation. And I, I would hope that we as restorative justice practitioners can kind of really uh, uh, um, you know kind of catch up and and get, at the top of our game so that we can meet the moment. Uh, these are truth and reconciliation movements and reparations movements that are suffer without our um, sensibilities, without our indigenous sensibilities, without our sensibilities about healing, um, without our sensibility about preventing recurrence of harm. Um, so many of these movements that are arising today don't have those uh, kinds of values and in large part it's because, or in many ways, uh, we're not there. So, you know, um, and I'm just, I guess I'm getting to promise. Um, are we on, is that what we're talking about anyway now? Yeah, okay, okay. And I'm gonna run and get my little pup and I'll be, I'll be right back. He's gonna join the conversation here. <laughs> well, you know you're going to live longer because you have a dog. <laughs> That's what my wife keeps saying. You live longer if you have a dog. <laughs> um, so uh, the the question of of the promise, um, a, a number of things that that Fanya was speaking to really um, resonate with me, and uh, one of those is that that the importance of us coming together with other um, streams of change, other impulses that I believe are rooted in the same place as, as our own work, as vision. I think of, of my own work as being about a vision of living together well. Uh, how do we live together well with, with core principles of love and non-domination? <laughs> And that, that there are a lot of other streams of change out there trying to move in that direction. And that if we can begin to link with those, that, that it'll move faster. And, and I think that it's really important that, that we try to bring these principles to, I mean, we have a problem <laughs> broadly in, um, in change efforts, that, that, that there's a tendency to use the tools of the master to, and to change who's in power 
but to still depend upon power over structures, right? To, as, as a solution to injustice. And, and, and I think that, you know, what restorative justice offers is different way thinking about uh, how do you, um, how do you uh, create this living together well without power concentrating in a new place, you know, taking it away from where it's been, but it concentrates in a new place. How do we, how do we keep power moving all the time so that it never stays with in any particular place? Um, and I think that 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 the work in restorative justice, in particular my own experience around Circle, is that that this is possible at a small scale. How do we figure out how to how to do this at a larger scale? Another element of because um, I because I think Fanya, you named so eloquently the fact that this country is seated in um, seated in harm that uh, my Native American um, beloved friend <laughs> um, Tanaga has taught me that when we are doing our own healing work in the present that we open the door for the healing of the ancestors. And for me, it's a very, very powerful idea that, that it's actually possible to heal, to support healing for the ancestors, that, that the past in fact can be healed. And that, that the, it's part of how I understand my work now, that, that my work is not just about changing conditions for people in the present, but that the, the work is also about healing, creating spaces for healing for the ancestors as well. And um, that I find that incredibly liberating um, because without that, as a white person, I'm sort of trapped as a perpetrator because of what has already happened. But with that possibility, I'm no longer trapped as a, as a perpetrator. And, and for me, it's just a very, very powerful idea. Um, and I think that what the restorative justice work brings to, you know, there are lots, as I said, there are lots of other movements trying to move toward how do human beings live together well with each other and with the earth? <laughs> um, that, that we have practical processes that help us to practice on a daily basis so that you can start to change the habits. The habits are so powerful. The existing culture is so powerful that, that we need actual ways of practicing together how we might be in a different kind of relationship and that the, the restorative practices offer that. But there are all these other movements with wonderful energies, with knowledge about the body, with knowledge from the neurosciences, the arts, that, that the, it is the coming together of all of these things that I think is, is really the promise and that what we're trying to do is access the best of human nature human nature has positive sides and it has negative sides, but that intentionally working to nurture and access the positive side of, of human nature is, is what the RJ work offers. And we're gonna struggle the entire time trying to live it because that's not how we were raised. <laughs> we're deeply acculturated in getting even <laughs> in punishment and, and even if you've been doing this for decades, uh, those impulses don't just disappear. So, not easy. <laughs> and that reality has made it hard for those of us who advocate restorative justice to actually live it and, pra and practice what we preach often. We've had, and that's one of the challenges, I think, is to, to be open to our critics, to, to to, to be aware of our privilege, all those kind of things that we, we don't always do that well. Yeah, I would say, um, going back to what Fani had said earlier, you know, 413 years ago, there was an indigenous leader out in the East Coast who asked the settlers, who posed this question to the settlers, 
you know, why should you take by force that which you may obtain by love? And, and that, that statement is as relevant today, if not more relevant today than it was 413 years ago. And I think it's going to call for some deep reflection on that. Because as an indigenous person, for me, restorative justice is honoring your treaties. And that's not individual. That's between peoples. Mm -hmm. So my, my challenge to the RJ movement is, if you wanna have true dialogue, and again, I can't speak for all indigenous peoples. I can only speak for my peoples. But if you want to have a true, authentic dialogue with us, first and foremost, please honor those treaties that your ancestors made with my ancestors. And it doesn't matter if your ancestors came 10 years ago to this country. The fact that you are a citizen, you, you commit yourself to those treaties that were negotiated 150 years ago with my people. And so I think for me, the one of the litmus tests is return of the stolen land, which is, and, and it is unceded. It's been annexed by settlers. It's been nationalized by settlers. And it's been a total appropriation. And so that, and that's not a big ask. Really, it's not a big ask to honor the treaties. You're, you're muted, Tom. This gets to my concern of, about a lot of the reparations movements. Um, it's not just about shifting some money around or shifting even some land around. It's about, uh, it's a fundamentally and radically anti-racial capitalist demand. I don't think we can truly um, of repair the harm uh, and under the UN law uh, and under common sense, reparations needs to include not just um, compensation, as important as that is, it also needs to include guarantees of non-recurrence. So how do we guarantee non-recurrence of systemic racism? How do we guarantee non-recurrence of uh, oppression uh, and theft from indigenous peoples. Racial capitalism is by definition theft. It's by definition of, of you know, har harmful in deep and, and thoroughgoing ways. Um, so, I mean, I mean, slavery and, 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 and genocide and land theft are bound up with the rise of capitalism. You can't have one without the other. So, you know, I think it's important that we in the restorative justice movement, as in other, you know, progressive movements, uh, are clear that, you know, we're talking about anti-racial capitalism. We're talking about um, anti-racism values. We're talking about being grounded in anti-hetero uh, patriarchal uh, values. Uh, it's not something that we can bypass. And I, I think white people especially uh, have a, a heightened responsibility uh, to e examine this and, and, and examine the ways in which they as individuals uh, perpetuate systemic um, racism and systemic uh, other forms of, of systemic domination. Um, because, I'm sorry, what is that? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 so, and I think in this sense, you know, Kay was talking about healing for the ancestors, and yes, absolutely, for the past, for the present, and for the future. I, I think we as restorative justice practitioners, um, if we could consider ourselves as, as agents for, that as people who are creating new worlds and, you know, as we sit in our circle, this is a liberated 
zone. This is a maroon community in the sense that African-American uh, formerly enslaved persons would escape and, and go into the hinterlands, into the mountains and, and create their own structures, uh, uh, liberated structures, health, education, governance. They create those spaces. And I see restorative justice spaces as those liberated spaces and, and, if, and embodying the values of the future and creating these spaces will call forth uh, the new future. So when, when we're doing our work, we're not just uh, uh, deepening community as important as that is. As Grace Box said, uh, as a species, we'll learn to survive only when we learn how to be in community. Uh, that's really important. And also important is the consciousness that we are, as restorative justice practitioners, creating new futures, uh, futures without domination of any sort, as, as Kay was, was saying earlier. Yeah, we are practicing it now, but we're calling it forth so that the future becomes now. Wow, it's hard to even speak after that, but uh, just in wanting to honor time and that there is a group of wonderful people here with us. Um, why don't we slide carefully and gently into uh, the dream, which has already been woven in this time, but would you be willing to consider um, with brevity, <laughs> um, what is your dream for the restorative justice movement? And I believe I heard much of that already from Tanya. Yeah just now and, um, and then that that gives us a few minutes to invite some questions, um, comments from you all present with us. Thank you so much for being here. So what is your dream? Um, what are your dreams or dreams for the restorative justice moment? Well, it's hard to say anything after finding it said it so well. Right. I mean, as restorative justice itself, my dream is that it will be part of a larger conversation, that it will be a catalyst for this, this kind of, exactly this kind of thing that Fania is talking about. Uh, you know, I don't know if the way we formulate, often formulate restorative justice is the end and all, but I hope it can be part of it, a catalyst for a conversation about, a, about how we live together, uh, you know, what we want for our world and, and some ways to get there. My dream is that that it gives us ways to practice and then ultimately move toward fundamental cultural transformation. The, the foundational beliefs of who we are as human beings and what's our relationship to each other and the earth, that, that restorative justice is a pathway for us to uh, examine those and, and find more life-giving you know, fundamental assumptions about about who we are and how we fit in with all the rest of the, the universe. And that's what I thought Fanny described more eloquently. <laughs> I, I think my, my probably more pragmatically speaking, what I dream of the RJ movement can do. Again, the RJ movement can open those spaces that, um, Fania was talking about, I dream of having my nation back, having our land returned so we can exist as a peoples again, so that we can honor our ancestors and the yet to be born as Lakota people. And that is not to the exclusion of settlers. But it has to be one in which the RJ movement will say, yes, we must return this stolen land. And we must recognize the sovereignty of the Lakota people, the right to coexist 
and not be threatened by erasure or our, our harm. You know, one of the one of the things about the treaties that we signed with settlers was to stop the harm. And that's the fundamental basis of our treaties with the settlers was to stop the ongoing harm that was happening. And if or the RJ movement can bring that realization to the rest of the settlers, then that would allow us to coexist as a peoples. That's my dream. If I could jump in just to, to amplify the, some very briefly uh, some of the things that I was saying earlier, this is a time of awakening, repair, and reimagining, especially since the summer of 2020, you know, um, with the public lynching of George Floyd. Uh, <clears throat> we see people reimagining uh, public safety. Of course, there was a loud uh, outcry for that right after the killing of George Floyd. It's, it's toned down some now, and it's, it's you know, not easy to defund police and figure out you know, what we do, alternative ways to ensure public safety. Uh, but all over the country, universities are reimagining themselves. Uh, uh, cultural organizations are trying to figure out how to become anti-racist institutions. Because uh, we learned from George Floyd that, uh, you know, it's not enough to tinker with, to reform and to try to fix uh, uh, policing in this country, it needs to be abolished because it is it is drenched in, saturated in white supremacy, in racial terror, um, and um, and it can't be fixed. And people are realizing that too. The same, you know, I, I see people reinventing education. We are reinventing justice in the justice movement, and we are creating new worlds. And I just can't emphasize the importance of, of the critical importance of being aware of that as we uh, sit in circles and sit in conferences and, and have restorative conversations. Um, and you know how, how we are called to be deeply grounded in values, not only of love, compassion, and open-heartedness, but also in anti-racial capitalists and anti-heteropatriarchal values and indigenous wisdoms about humanity and collectivity and responsibility. Just having that awareness as we do this work is a way of calling in the future. Uh, and it's, it's important at this time, this is a time of reimagining and creating new worlds. Linear time is very difficult in these spaces. Um, so I just want to honor linear time nonetheless. Um, Jonathan, thank you so much for creating this space together and with all of you. Um, we don't really have time for questions. And so I would like to make a bold proposal um, that perhaps we could invite uh, a reflection tomorrow at 5 p.m. Pacific. Um, because tomorrow we have a, a micro space with um, Eric Butler on values and restorative justice. And so in the time slot of 5 p.m., perhaps we could invite uh, more conversation about what, where we've gone today. And even further, if our guides today might be willing, um, if we come up with a distillation of questions, uh, perhaps those could be sent to each of you um, as a follow-up, so. Mm -hmm. Jonathan. I will, uh, I'm, I'm more than happy to uh, sponsor that space. Um, again, the Zoom space tomorrow, if that is, uh, if that's what, um, if that's what's needed and desired. Um, I do wanna say thank you to each of you, um, a non-pedestalizing thank you 
um, you all are are people that many of us um, look to, and rightfully so. Um, so thank you for your um, your sharing with us uh, stories and perspectives um, today. And thank you for reminding us this is Native American Heritage Month. Thank mm -hmm. you, Edward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're welcome. Good to see everybody. Good to see you all too. Thank wow. you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Molly, okay. would you like to offer some final announcements? Cool. Just a, an announcement would be, um, please join us if you can tomorrow with Eric Butler and Nidhi Upamaka for uh, what we're calling a micro training. Um, it will be on exploring values into action, restorative practices. And then um, 5 p.m. Pacific will be uh, an open reflection on today's um, discoveries, insights, further conversation. Um, and I'm not, I'm certainly not obligating you, Jonathan. <laughs> uh, please use the other Zoom link. And I apologize from the heart if there was any confusion about which link to use for today. Um, so use the week's Zoom access for all of the events this week. We also have Tuesday coming up an extraordinary session with Dr. Brenda Morrison and her colleague, and I, I'm so sorry, I don't have her name right in front of me, but um, it will be uh, a topic on healthcare and restorative practices uh, from lived experience of being harmed by the healthcare system. Um, so we'll look forward to updating you on the finalized schedule for the last part of the week as well. Uh, look for that tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Peace, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.